You're probably wondering, who am I? I'm the moderator of the panel. My name is Jeff Isaac. I teach political science at Indiana University. And it is my great pleasure to moderate this panel on innovative approaches. It's really a kind of best, pra best practices panel. And we've had conversations. There are a lot of exciting people here with really interesting things to say. So, and hopefully there'll be lots of time for some di real dialogue. Um, we agree to do our best to stick to the prescribed program, which means each of our speakers will speak for five minutes. And I will keep time and uh, interrupt them when they go over five minutes with a smile. Then there'll be a second round in which each of our speakers will speak for five minutes, and then hopefully there'll be time for some really good uh, discussion. Uh, I'm not gonna say a lot about our terrific panelists because you all have a copy of the program and their bios are on the program. I'll simply say a couple of things about each of the five people. Michael Newman is chief executive of the Association of Jewish Refugees, which represents and supports Holocaust refugees and survivors in Great Britain. Elisheva Flam Oren is the Director of Planning, Development, and Community Partnerships at AMCHA, the National Israeli Center for Psychosocial Support of Holocaust Survivors and the Second Generation. Darina Sedlakova um, has done many things. She was the founder or co-founder of the non-governmental organization Ziva Parmet Living Memory, and she serves as chairwoman of the administrative board and coordinator of the regional contact centers for victims of Nazism. Jada Waduin is the executive director of Action. I, I don't speak German. Action Susnezetchen. It's an international organization working to raise awareness of the Shoah and to fight racism, discrimination, and anti-Semitism. She will no doubt be able to describe her organization and also hopefully pronounce its name. Um, and finally, Galina Polyakova is founder and executive director of the Ukrainian charity uh, Age Concern Ukraine. These are terrific people. Each of them will speak twice for five minutes, and you guys are in for a treat. Michael will go first, and I start my timekeeping now. Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, I'll try and stick to the uh, prescribed program, but I'm sure I'm looking forward to the smile that I'm going to get in about five minutes' time telling me that I'm running over. So uh, allow me just a few words uh, at the outset to pick up on one of the issues that was discussed already, which is the definition of survivors, because in the UK, the majority of the Nazi victims in 1945 were the refugees who came prior to the war. And although some had come in the mid-1930s, the majority arrived in the 18 months between the Anschluss of March 38 and the outbreak of war in September 1939. And it's estimated that altogether some 70,000 people found refuge in Britain before the war, as compared to a few hundred of survivors who settled in Britain uh, at the end of the conflict. And the AJR itself, the Association of Jewish Refugees, was formed in 1941 which followed the reverse of the disastrous British government policy of internment when German-speaking refugees were interned for about a year. And I know we joke sometimes in the Jewish community that there can often seem more Jewish NGOs than there are Jews in a community, uh, which was the case at the time because there were organizations for Austrian refugees as opposed to Germans or Czechs, Zionists and communists. But the AJR itself was the one that outlived all the other organizations. And it is today the only UK national charity exclusively supporting survivors, refugees, and their families. Our membership stands at around 2,200, which includes a growing number of the second generation. And unlike uh, somebody else mentioned the average age of survivors worldwide, I think it was at 87 or 88, the AJR is actually 89 or 90. Uh, we have about 35 members who are over 100, and we have a, the world's oldest Holocaust survivor who's 110. We have, represent the former child survivors, uh, and also the kinder transport, approximately 10,000 people who came to Britain. Yesterday we heard from Mr. Maron, who came from what was Czechoslovakia, uh, through Nick, Sir Nicholas Winton. There were other groups, uh, Jewish and non-Jewish who were very active in helping to rescue the, the kinder, including, of course, the Quakers. And just as a way of background, 
the uh, origins, this conference today, it can trace its roots back to the 1997 London Nazi Gold Conference, which was convened by the then Foreign Secretary, Robin Cook, which used the momentum of the collapse of communism, the restitution lawsuits of the mid-1990s, the opening up of archives, which led to a lot of the restitution settlements and in turn led to the follow-up Washington Conference. Uh, one of the things I was thinking about in terms of the theme for this panel was about how to reach out to survivors. And the most effective network we have is our membership itself, the word of mouth. And I'd like to think this is because of how successful we've been at strongly supporting our members, that they talk to the services and the activities of the AJR to their relatives and their friends. And there was no smile, though. I didn't say no yet. This okay. is just a warning. The smile comes next. We, uh, and we're still also a strong advocate. Uh, I'm very proud that we've been able to represent them and guide them through social welfare services. We, uh, we organize a nationwide program, an outreach program, uh, similar to the lines of uh, Cafe Europa. And through these nationwide regional groups, which we help to break isolation for people, it gives members a unique opportunity to meet, to be amongst each other, to hear from guest speakers, to go on outings and holidays. Uh, just to give an example, earlier this month, we organized a trip for 40 of our members, a four-day visit to Scotland, which, yes, it's still part of the UK, at least this week it's still part of the UK. And they had a fantastic break, a chance to, as I said, to be amongst each other and to really enjoy a, 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 a something, something different for a change. And it's through these groups and survivors uh, that they, they're also able to reconnect with each other. And just to give you a scale of operation, there are about 3,000 attendances and about 500 meetings a year. We produce a monthly journal it's published every month since January 1946, so we're coming up to the 70th anniversary, combining news and topical analysis, historical overviews. Uh, and as well as colleagues in uh, organizations in the Jewish community working in social welfare, we cooperate with medical practitioners, local authorities, and residential homes, which gives us a multidisciplinary approach to assisting survivors. We're also a member of several networks, including Yom HaShoah and Memorial Day Trust, which gives survivors and refugees uh, the chance to learn about the services we offer. And in recent years, we've organized a number of high-profile events, which in themselves to commemorate key anniversaries, which gives us an opportunity to, pray, to raise awareness of all the activities we do. There's more to say, but I'll stop there. Thank you. Excellent. I want to first thank Esli, the directors, the staff, the co-chairs of the conference, the patrons, and the supporters for this important conference. Living with dignity, to my mind, is a call to action. It's about us. It's about we in our world. Can we provide dignity for survivors? I think that's the question that we're asking. We all believe and are committed to that, but the question is, can we provide dignity for survivors? It's about us all of us. It's also about here and now. We're talking about a conference that deals with issues of urgency and immediacy. It's time to act. Often at conferences at the end you say, farewell and hope to see you next year at the conference. This is not that kind of conference. It's all about here and now and decisions and action. I come as a representative and a citizen of the state of Israel, proudly, I think over recent years, the government of Israel has made significant advances to provide greater amounts of support for welfare survivors. Of course, there's more to do. And I come here in my role uh, as a director of the management team at AMCHA. AMCHA, or as was said in Yiddish, AMCHO, was the code word that was used by survivors in war-ravaged Europe to identify another Jew someone who they could trust, someone who they could speak to, someone who they could find some information about their family, about their community, someone who they could help or be helped by. It's not surprising that 30 years ago, when a group of Holocaust survivors and mental health professionals decided to establish an organization, an NGO in Israel, they decided to call it AMHA, 
nation, our nation, our people. That is really what it's all about. It's by creating a sense of community, creating an embrace, creating a place where people belong and feel connected, where they can find meaning, where they come together, where they see each other, they hear each other, where staff, 400 strong staff, choose to work every day with Holocaust survivors who know what they've experienced, who've taken the time to learn their diverse backgrounds, the differences of growing up and being here or there or elsewhere. Over the years, since Amaha was established almost 30 years ago, we now serve 18,000 Holocaust survivors all over Israel in 14 centers. We're about to open our 15th in the south of Israel as a result of uh, last summer's war and a greater demand for services. We provide 166,000 hours of therapy a year. About 30% of them are now provided in the homes of elderly survivors with limited mobility. We also operate social clubs, which are more than cultural entertainment um, or enrichment, but they're actually a therapeutic community where people come and spend as much time as they want on a regular basis. I see, I see the line there. I want to say a best practice that we've developed is integrative model of care, meaning that AMHA's model enables survivors to benefit from a comprehensive network of care that's based on mental health care, psychosocial clubs, community outreach, professional and volunteer home visits, recording personal histories, and intergenerational programming. This is thanks to funding from the government, claims conference, company for restitution, EVZ, federations, and others. Um, survivors can initially reach out for any one of the services mentioned, and over time be referred to and benefit from any and all of other elements, which complement one another. This integrative approach creates a seamless continuum of care and a compassionate therapeutic community. Our strong professional core and many opportunities for meaningful social connections with other survivors as well as with younger generations help the survivors experience the embrace of community and encourage mutual support. This enhances their ability to cope with their traumatic pasts while facing the challenges of old age and loneliness within the last chapters of life. One minute? One minute. All right, I'm good. Now 30. <laughs> 30 seconds. Our experience with some 18,000 survivors has shown us that now, 70 years later, there's a growing need, a desire, and the availability among aging survivors to deal with, uh, to deal with and resolve with issues that weigh on them in the present, echoing their past and impacting on the way they see their futures and what they'll be leaving behind. Dobré, krásné odpoledne. Já využiju možnosti, že výjimečně jsem na mezinárodní konferenci, kde mohu hovořit svým rodným jazykem, tedy češtinou. May I ask you please to switch to the translation, because I'm going to speak in Czech language. It's a very rare situation that I can speak Czech language and it in, in, on international uh, conferences, so I cannot miss the chance once. And I also want to make it easier for survivors who are in the audience and who are clients of the living memory. Takže teďko do té češtiny, myslím, že už máte. Funguje vám překlad? Můžu? Mně běží čas, tak já už musím začít. Takže, takže bych vás chtěla přivítat. You already started. Ano, I'm ready to start. There is no translation? There is translation. You, So you must, sign, uh, you must find uh, the channel. Uh, tak já bych se vrátila k tomu, čím jsem chtěla začít. Uh, včera i dneska jsme slyšeli od mnoha řečníků velmi zajímavé prezentace a já jsem se rozhodla, že nebudu pokračovat v tomto trendu a nebudu dělat žádnou prezentaci, protože už je druhý konferenční den, jsme po obědě a jsme všichni unavení, takže bych vás chtěla chtěla bych tu pozornost připoutat k jednomu tématu, které mě osobně je velmi blízké a které tady zaznělo v mnoha příspěvcích v průběhu obou dvou dnech, kdy mi předřečníci zmínili, že přeživší oběti nacismu, přeživší holokaustu a ostatní oběti nacistické persekuce často žijí osaměle a jsou ohroženi sociální, sociálním vyloučením, sociální izolací. Toto je téma, které je mojí organizací mě osobně velmi blízké, protože my jsme vznikli v roce 2003 v průběhu očkodňování, kdy jsme si uvědomovali, že 
A jedna věc je vyplatit obětem to, co jim náleží po právu a po zákonu, a to byly kompenzační platby z Německé nadace z Rakouského fondu smíření míry a spolupráce. A druhá věc je, že penězi to začíná a nekončí, že je potřeba zajistit, aby přeživší oběti nacistických persekucí mohly žít své životy nejen v důstojnosti, ale aby si jim dostávalo i naší pozornosti a péče. My jsme jako organizace vlastně vznikli na základě očkodňovacího procesu a rozhodli jsme se jít za horizont očkodňování a pečovat jak o vzpomínkový odkaz obětí nacismu, tak ale i o samotné oběti. To je možná to, co nás činí jedinečnými v českém kontextu, že zpracováváme jednak vzpomínky, vzpomínky přeživších pro různé vzdělávací účely. Vydali jsme například příručku pro čemnice dějepisu, multimediální výuková DVD, ale my se především věnujeme péči o samotné oběti. Provozujeme poradenské centrum už od roku 2007 díky kontinuální podpoře Ministerstva práce sociálních věcí České republiky a zejména provozujeme kontaktní centra pro oběti nacismu a mezigenerační dialog. A už v tom názvu je vidět, že se snažíme právě pro pro o propojování vlastně obou těch přístupů. Jedna chceme zajistit v těchto centrech pro přeživší možnost, aby měli smysluplné využití volného času, aby se mohli stýkat mezi sebou navzájem, mezi, se svými vrstevníky, ale i se zástupci mladších generací. Do činnosti center zapojeme i německé dobrovolníky, které k nám vysílá organizace reprezentována a mojí kolegyní v panelu Jutou organizace ASF a zároveň se snažíme zapojovat do činnosti těchto center, kterých máme celkem pět v České republice, dobrovolníky z řad mladší seniorů a také z řad studentů, kteří se nás často najdou sami a po určitou dobu dochází do našich center a pomáhají, pomáhají návštěvníkům center, například, když jdeme na výlety, dělají jim doprovod a podobně. My se domníváme, že péče o přeživší oběti nacistické prezekuce nemůže být redukována pouze na zdravotní a sociální péči. A to je něco, co je samozřejmé, co by měl zajišťovat každý stát, to je zodpovědnost států národních vlád, ale my se domníváme, že lidské bytosti nelze redukovat pouze na příjemce zdravotní péče a sociální pomoci, že mají svoji Dimenci, lidskou dimenci, která zahrnuje také potřebu sociálního kontaktu, jsou to spirituální potřeby, náboženské potřeby, kulturní potřeby a právě ty se snažíme prostřednictvím aktivit nabízených v našich centrech naplňovat. A za velmi důležité považujeme, že mnozí návštěvníci center, kteří vlastně začali chodit a byli zvědaví, co jsme pro ně připravili, postupně začali sami připravovat program pro ostatní návštěvníky center, takže chází takovým situacím, že máme přeživšího studenta 17. listopadu 39, který pana doktora Srdečného, který strávil tři roky v koncentračním táboře Sachsenhausen a ve svých 93, letos mu bude 94, na podzim ve svých 93 letech vede jednou měsíčně cvičení pro seniory v našem, centru, našem prvském centru. A další využívají vlastně své nabité zkušenosti celoživotní a pořádají pro ostatní nejrůznější přednášky na téma zdravého životního stylu, cestování, přednášky z historie a na další témata. Tento projekt vlastně může fungovat díky podpoře Stiftung FAUZ, která také podpořila konání této konference a za podporu samozřejmě z tohoto pody já ráda poděkuju. Pokud jde vlastně o ten Aha, to je poslední minutu. Pokud je o ten druhý aspekt, což je práce s tím, se vzpomínkami, tak tu realizujeme právě v našich kontaktních centrech prostřednictvím nahrávání vzpomínek na audio a na video záznamy. A tyto nahrávky se potom stávají samozřejmě materiálem pro další využití ve vzdělávací praxi. A zatím ty naše vzdělávací projekty jsme cílili především na školní mládež a na učitele dějepisu, ale rádi bychom rozšířili vzdělávání o 
různých formách nacistické prezekuce i na pracovníky v sociálních službách a o tom bych po, asi pohovořila až v tom druhém kole, protože mám pocit, že teď právě mi čas vypršel, takže zatím děkuji za pozornost. First of all, I want, I also want to thank you for being invited here. Oh, I have the phone still. <laughs> Get the translation to check. Um, and the, the correct um, pronunciation of our organization is Aktion Sühnezeichen Friedensdienste. We can, we can talk about that later. And uh, actually it's translated to all the countries or to the languages in the countries where we work. And um, a translation would be sign of atonement, action sign of atonement, peace services. The organization was founded um, in 1958, so uh, 13 years after the end of World War II, and it was founded by members of the Protestant Church, and they wanted to take responsibility that they themselves, they as members of the church, said that they did not resist enough, also within the churches, that there was not enough resistance against uh, the Nazi regime. And the idea back then was to send volunteers to countries um, that have a population that really suffered from the Nazi, Nazi persecutors or uh, countries themselves who were occupied and to send volunteers there for a year who would help um, or would, would refer to the needs of the countries. And um, this, this idea is, was then implemented and now we have um, almost 200 volunteers who go abroad for a year. They go to 13 different countries. And I'm really glad that uh, all of the, the persons who are sitting here on the panel, that they are somehow related to our volunteers. Um, in the, the, the persons who spoke before me, we have volunteers in their um, projects. And with, with my Ukrainian colleague, she is related to projects that also um, volunteers of us work in. So they work with Holocaust survivors, they work in memorial sites, they give in the pedagogical field, they work in political projects against anti-Semitism, against racism, against homophobia, against racism, against Roma. This is a very important field. They work with the handicapped people or disadvantaged people. And right now we are mostly speaking about um, the assistance they give to, to the Holocaust survivors who they work with in all 13 countries where we have volunteers. And of course the focus of our volunteers' work is that they assist and, and give help to the survivors but what is really important for us that it's not one-sided, that the help is not one-sided, but that we really see how much the volunteers benefit from the exchange with the survivors, and non, not only with the survivors, but also with their children and with their grandchildren. So that is really important. So when the, the, the volunteers meet um, survivors and their families, they are full of not only stories, but they are full of the experience of meeting individuals, um, diverse people, survivors to, to hear their stories, but also um, to, to be in touch with them and to learn something about them personally. And since we are speaking about um, innovative pro programs, um, we and this also refers to what was mentioned today on one of the other panels when there was a representative from the Israeli ministry who, who was speaking about a project that is called Dorot Generations. We have a project that is called similarly, that is called Dor Le Dor, from generation to, to generation. And it was a project where we invited survivors from Israel to Germany to speak to school classes and to meet people to talk to, but we did not only invite them themselves, um, the survivors themselves, but they came either with, with a daughter or a son or with a grandchild. And what was important then was not that they, um, that they escorted them or that they were with them, but what was important that they also told their stories. So the children and the grandchildren told their stories. 
which means they did not only retell the stories of the, the, the first generation, but they told um, pupils at school how it was to be raised in a house with parents who were Auschwitz survivors, how it was that the parents did not tell because they wanted to protect their children, but the children, of course, they knew what, uh, that there was something and that um, how, how the children or the grandchildren found out what happened. And in many cases, they, they were not told by their parents themselves, but um, found out when the parents wrote, wrote books or when they went to school classes and they, they joined them. So, um, it, it, so it's the, the children and grandchildren have to tell their own stories and this is something what is really important for us. So the, um, the exchange is something what, what is really important and what we see, the, the fruits of the exchange we see with our volunteers. Thank you. Dear colleagues, uh, I'm so glad that I am here with you and uh, that I learned a lot from you and that I can share something from our experience. So this Ukraine, Ukrainian charity, uh, Each Concerned Ukraine, or Turbota Prolitnik v Ukraini. We exist for about 16 years and we uh, work in, um, we have branches in nine uh, cities in Ukraine and we have uh, 1,500 elder volunteers. However, uh, and we were focused just on elder people. However, uh, eight years ago, we met uh, our colleagues from uh, German Federal Fund, if I would say, you all know this uh, wonderful, interesting organization. And now we work with them as well. And we have um, another very important target group, people who suffered from Nazis from World War II. For Ukraine, it's extremely important because Ukraine was completely uh, occupied and uh, apart from people who suffered from Holocaust, we had lots of people who were on the occupied territory and who lost their parents in World War II and of course their life was not, not quite easy, not quite happy. Um, if we speak of innovations, yes, this uh, cooperation, this new focus of our activity has brought us a lot of new and very interesting things. Uh, first of all, we um, uh, have new core of uh, young volunteers, which for our country, for our culture, is very big novelty. And we also realized uh, that um, all the people, uh, those who suffered from Nazism, from World War II, so they are not just recipients. And if we remember uh, the well-known pyramid by Maslow, we know that uh, to feed a person, to give uh, clothes, uh, medicines, uh, is not enough to make them happy. They want to be needed. They want to be involved, involved, not be alone, not be isolated. And we know that isolation is the shortest way to abuse. So we want to make these people not isolated, to be involved, not just as recipients, as the receivers of services, of some goods, but people who feel that they are needed, that they are important. Uh, how can we expect that from people in their 80s, in their 880s? Yes, we can. Uh, we have very good experience when these older people who have restricted mobility, they can make telephone calls and call their peers to support them, to talk to them. You know that loneliness is really horrible when the telephone is mute, that no one even calls to you. So these telephone calls made by people who are sometimes immobile are very important for both sides, for those who make calls and for those who receive them. Uh, these are social visits, however old and frail they are, but visiting their friends to talk, to have a cup of tea together is a great, the biggest event. And, uh, you know, um, we had experience when a very expensive uh, school um, had an uh, interesting um, project with people who were in orphanage in 1943, and they worked with uh, uh, 
children worked with these people and they collected them, they made very good contacts and the project was finished. The parents collected money and continued this for three years. Why? Because it was helpful and very useful for children as well. There was uh, some counseling, all the people could uh, make uh, good advice, they could talk to them, and the parents realized it's very good, it's very helpful for their children. It's very interesting for us. And uh, uh, we also know that in case of need, the network which had been developed uh, through this uh, program, Meeting Point Dialogue, gives us a very good opportunity to provide support to those people who now are dying of starvation on the territories of Donetsk Oblast occupied by terrorists. Because our colleagues over there, they can deliver the food to those people who are at home immobile. So this category of our people, the older people who suffered from horrible Second World War, they're very active, they're very keen, and they're very, very reliable. Thank you. These people are great. They have great things to say, and they've really kept within the limits. So we're going to go now into our second round of five-minute comments. And I hope you'll pass back those sheets to me, because I don't have any more paper. Thanks. And Michael can go first. Thank you. Uh, thinking about how we represent our members, in the UK, because there are a relatively small number of survivors, refugees, compared with other countries, and because they're spur dispersed quite nationwide, we operate an umbrella group of organizations, which is a, an ad hoc committee, a forum, where organizations come together to discuss best practice and make a single a unified application for funding, for example, to the claims conference. Our budget is around three and a half million euros. And through the umbrella group, we're able to learn from each other, but also dovetail our services so that we're not duplicating. And because it's a relatively small number of people that we're serving in the end, it, it's quite an effective model. Uh, and we're able to keep the organization running for about uh, 20 years. We, it also gives us uh, th the opportunity through each other's networks to learn from each other. So one of the organizations has more of an a national reach, for example, of social workers. Another offers psychotherapeutic assistance. Some of the organizations serve the Orthodox community. And so between us, we're able to cover and reach out to and connect to quite a large percentage of the survivor refugee community. One of the other things that we're, within the AJR, quite committed to doing is uh, representing our members by helping to train our staff. We think it's very important that they have up-to-date skills, that they've participated in training, whether it's on social welfare benefits or dementia, residential care. But through those training opportunities, we're able to give our colleagues the best, the latest information about how they can then best represent and advocate for our members. So our members are then empowered through the work of our social work team. And the same goes for our volunteers. Uh, my colleague mentioned about the ARSP. We've been fortunate to benefit from the services of an intern for the last six years. And for us, it's a great program. The young people that come are very committed. It's quite a, quite a detailed application that they have to go through in order to get onto this program. But once they're in London, they're very much signed up to the work of the organization. And we also benefit from the fact that the other volunteers in the UK give some of their time to come and befriend AJR members. So even though they're not working directly for the AJR, we benefit indirectly from having them as additional befrienders. And the befriending work that the volunteers do is really the core activity of our volunteers. In fact, some of our members who are themselves in their 70s and 80s are themselves volunteers. We have some of our members talking about going to visit their little old lady when they themselves are 85. 
So it's, it's quite a nice sort of circular way of helping people within the organization. It's very much a sort of family feel to it. The other uh, chief uh, main way that we uh, represent and support people, our members, is with assistance through advice and guidance on restitution and compensation. We've talked here about the child survivor payment and the pension for Polish victims and also for uh, ghetto survivors. But just in addition to the tax exemptions that we've talked about, this is that's something that the UK has benefited, survivors in the UK have benefited from for a number of years. There's no income tax, no inheritance tax, no capital gains tax. And one last innovative thing that other countries might consider is we made a, an agreement with the British Bankers Association that well, there will be no commissions levied on Holocaust reparations. So whenever banks remit pen pensions or payments, sometimes the banks, because it's coming from overseas, they take a charge. They've removed that, and where a charge is inadvertently charged, made, then it's possible through the guidelines to recover those, uh, those sums. I'll let others speak. Thank you. At this point, I'd like to say this would be a great opening session for another conference, because I feel there's a lot that we could share in terms of best practices and learning from the current work and the challenges which we need to solve immediately, because there's no time to come back next year, but the sense is urgency at what we're providing now. Um, I want to go back to something Stuart said when he talked about, uh, not Stuart, actually, Greg, who talked about physical, dental, and mental. And I'd like to say that from our experience, the power of being able to engage in psychosocial work and the chance to talk through issues for those survivors who never spoke, it might be the last opportunity to open up and share their stories and have a sense of a legacy that goes beyond them. For survivors who've talked for their entire life, the need to bring some closure and sometimes repair tears that happened as a result of ongoing talk is an important time right now in survivors' lives and in their families' lives. I think it's also too important to recognize the expansion when we talk about mental, to talk about the fact that people facing end of life, there are spiritual issues, there are broader issues that need to be engaged, and there's an opportunity to do retrospective work, life review work, which has been very, very beneficial for survivors at this point. It can have a tremendous sense of relief, both as they resolve issues and also as they prepare and look at the future and look at how they, what their expectations are, what they're leaving behind in the world. It's an issue that they talk much about. What they leave, what is their legacy? What are they leaving behind? What kind of world is it today? What are they leaving for their children and grandchildren? These are conversations that if we don't ask, we might not have. So I encourage organizations to be involved in these kinds of questions and conversations. A second issue I'd like to focus on is caregiver support. The, the wear and tear on caregivers, if they are family caregivers who are often children second generation, they might be professional caregivers, they might be therapists on our team who work with a large caseload, many people very elderly. How do we support caregivers so they can ultimately support the survivors themselves? How do we provide programs that address family caregivers, professional caregivers, Paraprofessional caregivers who come from different countries and cultures who have no understanding of some of the concerns and the sensitivities of Holocaust survivors, possibly about food, possibly about wearing uh, a pajama, possibly about being showered, possibly about being hospitalized. These are issues that we can provide a lot of support by providing caregiver training and ongoing support for those who are involved in their care. It's also true for volunteers. There are many young people today who are willing to be engaged and there needs to be more than one-time meetings, but to try to build relationships that have content for the younger generation and for the survivors themselves. So caregiver support, I think, is an important issue. It is also important to engage the community at large. So continuing to do work in the area of awareness and public relations and education and to be able to bring those stories to life. We're living in an era where the people who now, the next generations, will be the the current generations will be the last to actually hear the stories directly from survivors. They will carry that memory. They will then tell the stories in the years to come. So it's a very, very critical period to provide that opportunity, but to do it right and to do it with sensitivities. Um, I'd like to talk about the fact that there are gaps in the services that we need to identify and respond to quickly. I think that ultimately 
um, we're going to be looking at a larger number of people with cognitive impairment, with limited mobility, and there's going to be a need to use greater technology to share that knowledge and to be very user-friendly and very client-centered to be able to provide the appropriate responses for survivors. That was amazing, four minutes. Děkuji svým předřečníkům, že otevřeli téma vzdělávání těch, kteří přeživším obětem nacistické prezekuce poskytují pomoc, ať už v domácím prostředí, či v nejrůznějších institucích typu rezidence pro seniory, denní centra a, nebo prostřednictvím agentur domácí péče. A já jsem za to velmi ráda, protože mě to utvrzuje v přesvědčení, že nápad, který jsem pojala někdy v roce 2010, a když jsem moderovala takovou vzpomínkovou kavárnu pro seniory v jednom z domovů pro seniory v severočeském kraji, my jsme tam přenesli setkání kontaktního centra, protože někteří z našich klientů v tom domově bydleli a jak šel čas a jejich zdravotní stav se zhoršoval, nemohli už dojíždět za námi, tak jsme se rozhodli, že přijedeme za nimi a pozvali jsme zároveň všechny ostatní obyvatele domova pro seniory, což byly samozřejmě osoby, které bychom mohli označit jako osoby 80 plus. A mezi zhruba 35 z těchto návštěvníků jsem po dvou hodinách zjistila, že bychom mohli minimálně 30 považovat za osoby, když ne přímo oběti nacistické prezekuce, tak osoby s osobním prožitkem druhé světové války. A mě to nepřekvapilo, ale překvapilo mě, že to překvapilo sociální pracovníky toho zařízení a ošetřovatelky, které byly po celé to setkání přítomny. Protože pro ně to byla novinka. Oni se najednou dozvěděli, že mezi jejich klienty, mezi obyvateli jejich domova, jsou ti, kteří za druhé světové války utrpěli nejrůznější formy nacistické persekuce, ať už to byly osoby, které pocházely z politicky pronásledovaných, či rasově pronásledovaných rodin, nebo bývají nuceni nasazení, nebo ti, kteří v dětském věku byli přítomně domovní prohlídkám gestapa. A případně byli nuceni po záboru Československého pohraničí v roce 1938 opustit se svými rodiči své domovy a odejít do neznáma. To mě vedlo k myšlence, že bychom měli uvažovat v rámci vzdělávání rozšířit akční rádius a vzdělávat nejen učitele dějepisu a vzdělávat nejen studenty, ale vzdělávat sociální pracovníky, respektive všechny, kteří pracují v sociálních službách právě o těchto otázkách zpětých z minulosti, protože oni jsou sice experti na sociální služby, ale dějepis měli možná naposledy někde v prvním ročníku na střední škole v lepším případě, případně v posledním ročníku základní školy a samozřejmě když jsem se poptávala, jestli byl zájem o takovýto typ vzdělávání, tak mi řekli ano, protože by jim to umožnilo lépe a mezi jejich klienty rozpoznat a ti, kteří v minulosti trpěli nacistické pronásledování a zároveň by jim to umožnilo vlastně těmto osobám lépe naslouchat a také tím pádem lépe uspokovat jejich specifické potřeby. Abych si ověřila tu teorii, vlastně, jestli by byl takový zájem vlastně i mezi těmi, kteří by měli být na druhé straně, tak v roce 2013 jsme v rámci jedné psychoterapeutické skupiny, kterou vedeme s paní doktorkou Roubalovou z institutu Rafael každý měsíc v živé paměti, tak jsme se zeptali našich klientů, a zda by vlastně, pokud by se ocitli v domovech pro seniory, zda by vlastně stáli o to, aby s nimi sociální pracovníci vlastně o těchto otázkách diskutovali. A já si dovolím citovat z některých odpovědí. Ano, chtěla bych o tom mluvit. Když se stmívá, tak čím jsem starší, tím více bojím. Za války nás asi nosili jako děti do sklepa, byla tam tma. O osudu bych chtěla pracovníci vyprávět, ale záleželo by to, zda by byla připravena naslouchat a zda by se mě uměla správně ptát. Děkuji. Další. Člověk potřebuje mluvit o sobě. Je důležité, abych měl pocit, že mě někdo naslouchá, že mě slyší a potřebuji cítit, že má na mě pracovník čas. 
Myslím si, že se nemusí mluvit jen o traumatu, ale potřebuji mluvit o čemkoliv. Potřebuju mít kontakt a potřebuju, aby se o mě někdo aktivně zajímal. Je vidět, že se zde propojily dvě potřeby. Potřeby přeživší, kteří jsou díky svému věku zdravotnímu stavu a díky tomu, že mnozí nemají rodinu, která by o ně mohla pečovat, odkázání na institucionální péči a potřeby těch, kteří v rámci těchto zařízení tuto péči a mám poslední minutu, tak rychle shrnu. Z té myšlenky, vlastně z té původní myšlenky, z toho nápadu nakonec vznikl vzdělávací produkt, který jsme zpracovali v roce 2013 ve spolupráci s ESLI. A tento vlastně vzdělávací seminář získal akreditaci ministerstva, školství, pardon, ministerstva práce sociálních věcí a je zaměřený právě na vzdělávání o nacistické prezekuci a na tréninku sociálních pracovníků. A seminář má si chce akreditaci, ještě nebyl uvedený do praxe a já doufám, že se nám to společnými silami v nejbližším období podaří, protože včera byl pozdě, jak se říká, a v, v tomto věku tedy čas běží dvakrát rychleji a my bychom rádi, aby tento vzdělávací projekt vlastně z té národní úrovně postupně nabyl mezinárodní podobu, aby se do něho zapojili i další organizace, mnozí zástupci mnozí z nich jste zde s námi a abychom postupně vytvořili platformu, na které by se mohli sociální pracovníci vzdělávat a předávat si své zkušenosti a vzájemně se učit navzájem a také výštět na zahraniční praxe. Tak bude to jenom otázka peněz, protože dobrá vůle a vlastně zpracovaný projekt tady je. During the last two days, we, um, it was often mentioned that there are, um, our work is concerned by demographic developments. And um, I also want to focus on that, but with another perspective. When talking about volunteer services, especially in our organization that relates to the Holocaust, or when speaking about Holocaust education, We often speak about um, the fact that we have a lot of immigration nations, like Germany is an immigration nation, and there is the, the question if, is raised if this um, changes something due to how to feel responsible for, 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 for the past, for the German past, and um, for dealing with the Holocaust. And as Germany is an immigration nation, we always have volunteers, and that's really important for us, who have diverse ethnic backgrounds, and we do not experience or we do not see that the, the um, ethnic background correlates to the interest in dealing with the Nazi past. We have volunteers with Turkish or Arabic backgrounds, And uh, though they work with in Holocaust memorial sites or they visit Holocaust survivors, and it is really interesting when talking to them that um, they, when when working in that field, they um, they do not they they are not confronted with problems that the people would say, how come that you are working with us? How come that you are interested? But what is really interesting is that they um, that they experience for the first time in their life that when going abroad that they are for the first time in their lives perceived as Germans. Within Germany, they are always perceived as foreigners, and when coming to other countries, they, they are perceived as Germans, which means that they are also related to the, to the German past. And this is something what is really important to us to deal with. So for us, it's, it's when, when talking about volunteer services, for us it's, it's important to um, have diverse volunteers or to have the diversity within the, the, um, within the volunteer groups and within the volunteer services. And when speaking about diversity, um, it's, I mentioned that before in the first round, that um, for us it's, it's really important that uh, the volunteers who come in touch with survivors or with their families, that they see them as individuals, so not only as survivors, but also as individuals who have different opinions and who are of 
who are individuals. And what is really and, um, and the point when it becomes to be very interesting is when they have different political opinions and to see and to get into discussion. And to give uh, one or two examples for that, we had last year, we had um, a volunteer, until last year we had a volunteer who was volunteering in the Crimea. And uh, when the, when, when the, the, the um, uprising started and, uh, on the Maidan and when, when, when there was um, the crisis on the Crimea, she was the, the volunteer, she was pretty much re, um, with young people who opposed the annexion, but the elderly people she visited at their homes, they were in favor of the Russian annexion. And that was really interesting. So what we always said is it's good that there are different political opinions and um, have political discussions. And um, people are, when, when you have exchange of people, uh, you also have different um, political opinions, and that's really important and good to know. So what, what is important without, within our work is that, that all, uh, all our volunteers are confronted with different perspectives on history and different perspectives on volunteers and the, uh, on, on politics, and this is something what makes them politically mature. Uh, the experience I'm going to speak now um, is not very happy. And I strongly hope that none of you, not single country, will ever have this experience. It is a war in Ukraine, you may know. And um, we have about 1,200,000 internally displaced people. Many of them are elder people. But even in the worst position are those who stayed in those parts of uh, Lugansk and Donetsk Oblast. Um, officially, they're called non-government controlled areas. We, Ukrainians, just say occupied areas. I'm not going to speak about political side of that. But on that territory, there are old people, about 1,700 people, the so-called Ostrobiters, and lots and lots of their peers of people of the same age, and we have contact with them, where they phone us, and they tell us. When we were in Nazi concentration camps, we had two meals a day. Now we have only one. So there are deaths caused by starvation. That's horrible that in the 21st century, in the middle of Europe, people, elder people, are dying of starvation. There were about 10,000 uh, residents in nursing homes. Uh, I must admit that uh, our nursing homes, uh, uh, homes for elder people, uh, are the last places where the loving family may place their mommy or daddy. About 7,000 people were evacuated, 3,800 people stayed in the occupied area, and these are 18 institutions for people with psychoneurological problems. Uh, three months later, there were only 3,000 of them. 800 died, died mainly of starvation, malnutrition, and poor care. We, we found some money from IFAOZ fund, from URAG, from French embassy, from French Caritas, and we did, well, managed to transport there some food. It's not enough. It's very difficult to uh, penetrate in that area. Lots of permissions, lots of passes, of documents from Ukrainian side and from uh, that side. If you have any idea, if you can help me, can, can advise, can prompt, can give some information, how can we find money to buy, to purchase food, to be delivered on that area? I'm so sorry to 
repeat that, but people are dying of starvation. That is horrible. I understand they are very old and they are late 80s, 90s. They, they will die soon as every living being die, but not of starvation. If you can help, please. Thank you. There's time, there's plenty of time actually for some conversation, for some questions. I, I wanna thank the panelists for, for being really brief and for saying really important things. And I, I wanna thank especially uh, the last commentator for uh, bringing our historical and moral concerns back to the present.